what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And uh, I have Todd Brown with me. I'm going to formally introduce in a second. But Todd, I always like to point out other episodes that people should check out. And according to Todd, one of the top marketers, top direct people in direct response, I thought it would be appropriate to mention, mention some of those people. So past episode with Ron Popeil, um, unfortunately, may rest in peace. He died uh, fairly recently, but an amazing interview. And uh, I saw your post, Todd, about... Um, uh, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt uh, recently about just grit. And uh, Ron Peel used to wake up at like three in the morning to go get vegetables and fruit so he can prep it to for his Vegematic and get there at 5 a.m. It was unbelievable, uh, the work ethic wow. and the grit he had. Um, check out the interview with Ryan Levesque. I know you're close friends with him, Andre Chaperone, Caleb O'Dowd, um, Brian Kurtz, Richard Armstrong, and John Carlton. We did an interview with all three of them. So check out that and many, many more on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to your dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And for me, uh, over the past over a decade, the, you know, I've been podcasting and the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking for ways to give to my best relationships. And when I came on with Todd, he's like, he's of the same. He's like, I just want to deliver as much value as humanly possible to you in the audience. And I just love having the people and companies I admire and shout from the rooftops what they are doing. And so, you know, we were going to talk a little bit more about it, but you can go to e5bundle.com to check out more about what Todd is doing and we're going to get deeper into it. So if you have questions about podcasting, you can go to rise25.com um, and email us anytime, support at rise25media.com. And Todd Brown, if you don't know who he is, you should. Todd Brown's the founder of E5 Method. He's considered one of the top authorities on engineering profitable customer acquisition campaigns. And they have clients in over 64 countries operating in over 71 different markets. So it's like, well, does he know what I'm doing with my market? Well, it doesn't matter. It applies to all the markets. Todd has helped his students engineer six and seven figure marketing campaigns. His list of coaching students, consulting clients and subscribers are some of the who's who of A-list entrepreneurs. You can check it out, like I mentioned, e5bundle.com. Todd, thanks for joining me. I'm excited to be here. How many years has it been since we spent some time together? It's probably five, been six, seven, five. It's probably been, been like about four or five years. And the funny thing is, you know, I knew you when you were in the chiropractic niche many years ago um, because you were one of the leaders in, in that as far as you know, um, patient acquisition and systems and everything like that. So how long ago were you in the chiropractic niche? Oh, goodness. My goodness. So I've been, it's almost 20 years, two, two decades since I've been um, in the direct response world. I think chiropractic, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, 11 years ago, mm -hmm. something like that, give or take. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was an interesting, uh, an interesting ride, uh, super competitive space, a lot of great marketers in there. Uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I've been in a number of niches over the years for sure. I want to talk in, you know, we'll, we'll fast forward through your background a little bit, but I know you're from New Jersey. I know that, um, you know, you say like you weren't the best student that you really took to bodybuilding and yeah. I don't know if you still do that. And I'd love for you to talk, start off talking about just some of the discipline in bodybuilding and business. And when you started to hit um, marketing and the business scene bigger and people saw what you're doing, they may have like, oh, he got lucky. They don't see the grit and all of this stuff that you're doing behind the scenes. So just talk about the discipline piece from the bodybuilding to the marketing and what, what it takes as far as that goes. 
Yeah, great question. I don't get to talk about this often, but uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I grew up, I was really a really skinny kid. Uh, I was always short, still I'm short, I'm only 5'5". Five, five. And so I was like this really tiny, you know, tiny dude. And so in my sophomore year, well, actually, let me back up. So I wrestled in high school. And the funny thing was that I was like 20 pounds under the lowest weight. Class. Wow. So while, while everybody else was weighing in in their underwear on the scale, I, w I was like wearing my jacket, like, you know, I was weighing in and fully clothed. And I remember the other team w used to laugh. Like anytime I got on the scale, they, they would laugh. And so I decided that I was going to start weightlifting to see if I could put on any, any weight. This was my sophomore year now in high school. And for whatever reason, my body just really took to, um, to weight training. I put on like 15 pounds or something like that in the first year that I was training. And then I decided that I was just going to continue, um, continue training. What attracted me to bodybuilding and what I, what I loved about bodybuilding besides the, the, the physical transformation was that I was 100% responsible for my success. So it was all about me the effort that I put in, I wasn't, there was no team. There was nobody else that I could point the finger at. It was, was all about me. And I, I found number one, that, uh, that I wanted the goal so bad. I wanted to be successful competing on stage so bad that when it came to things like my, my workout schedule and doing cardio and eating six times a day at specific times, specific foods, specific portions, all of that, that um, the desire for the goal was stronger to me than the desire to cheat or deviate or, or, or any of that kind of stuff. And so, you know, people used to look at me as super disciplined, even still to this day, like my wife who knew me back then, uh, uh, I've known her that long. My wife would say like, you're, you know, the most disciplined person I know. I really think first and foremost, the, the lesson for everybody is that, even when folks ask me, what's the secret to discipline? I always say like, look, you either want it or you don't. And that's the truth. The truth is when people are like, how do you get motivated every day? Like the goal that you have, the mission that you are on, the vision that you have for yourself should be so strong that that is where all the motivation and drive comes from. And if not, I would tell you that you either need to find a different goal or outcome, or you need to dig deeper into the goal to find out and, and to really get in tune with why it's important to you. Uh, because you either want it or you don't, right? And if you want it bad enough, you're gonna do what you've gotta do. And so as it relates to the, you know, to the disciplines, uh, I, I think, look, you know, you, you have to, to, to put this into something that's actionable for folks, you have to identify what you need to be doing daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly to hit whatever goal it is that you have for your business. You shouldn't be showing up to the computer and wondering what am I gonna do today or what am I gonna do this week? You shouldn't be rethinking your whole strategy and, and, and approach on a constant basis, like rethinking your model, rethinking your methods. You wanna make a commitment to what it is that you're, you're gonna do to reach your goal. And then you put your nose to the grindstone and you do it. And so the beauty with, you know, like the beauty with the, with bodybuilding, and, it, and this goes for just all physical transformations, everybody is constantly looking for the magic bullet, the magic bullet diet, the magic bullet weight training or fitness program, and is this better or is this better? Does this work or does that work, right? Same thing with marketing, same thing with business growth, when the reality is, is that most of the methods work if you just put your nose down and just continue to press forward with patience. You just got to do it day in and day out. You got to be committed to doing it day in and day out. And that commitment comes from having this burning desire to reach the outcome, a desire that is more powerful than deviating from that path. Does that make sense? Totally. And I want to talk about, um, you know, an irresistible offer. I remember when you spoke at Brian's, you almost reverse engineer a sales letter or sales copy by starting yeah. with the offering. And you approach it differently from what I've heard from, from a lot of people. And I loved how you kind of went through it, but it makes perfect sense. So I love to talk about what needs to be in an irresistible offer. And I remember, you know, just reverse engineering, you know, um, I strive to be like you with the with more of my workouts actually. But, you know, I just recently, I'm, I decided I'm going to train for a Murph. Okay. 
Um, and if people don't know what Murph is, you can look it up. It's a cross training. And by the way, I don't do a lot of weightlifting, but it's funny when you get a coach, an expert who knows what they're doing, they start to just reverse engineer with you. And that's why it's, it's really important, whatever you decide to do, to have a mentor or a coach to walk you through and make sure you're doing the right steps because there's so many of those things. So um, talk about the offer and in the irresistible offer a little bit. Yeah. So let, I love this topic. Let's start. Let's back up just a second to make sure that everybody's got the, the context here. So first and foremost, what is an offer, right? So an offer is what does the prospect get and what do they need to give um, and do to, to get it. And so what does the prospect get and what do they need to do and give to get it? Now in that, in that context, it's important for folks to understand, we're not only talking about like the, the, the money, right. At, that they, that they give. And we're not only talking about the product that they get, but we're talking about what is the time, energy, effort, um, risk, learning, uh, adoption that the prospect has to go through um, to get the reward. So when we're talking about what does the prospect get? Yes, we're talking about um, what are the deliverables? Like what's the product? What are the physical things that get put in their hand? But we're also, and especially talking about the results, the outcome, the transformation, the change, the alleviation of pain, all of that stuff. And then what do they need to do or give to get it? That includes money, but that also includes their time, energy, effort, learning, study, and so on. And you'll understand in just a bit why it's important to view an offer that way. Now, the next point that I want to make before we dive into the components of an irresistible offer is this, that the offer is it is a make or break component of every marketing campaign, meaning that this, to put it plainly, meaning that a great offer, an over the top offer, what we call a sin offer, superior, irresistible, no brainer. A great offer can make up for a lot of marketing weaknesses, a lot of marketing shortcomings. Like with a great offer, you don't have to be that great of a, of a marketer or salesperson. You don't have to have a great, uh, a great marketing copy, right? Like, and you can still do really well. But great marketing copy, great marketing, gr a great funnel, all that stuff will never make up for a run of the mill plain vanilla, uh, ordinary offer. And so the offer is the single most important component of any marketing campaign, second to just making sure that you've identified the right audience. So assuming that you've got the right audience, you're talking to the right people, the people that would be interested in your, uh, your product or service, the next priority is the offer way ahead of the copy, the message, the idea, the hook, the theme, all of that stuff. And so it is, uh, it is that important. The better the offer is, the easier everything else becomes. The weaker the offer is, the harder everything else uh, becomes. And you will never have the level of success that you could until you have a great offer. So what makes for a, a an irresistible offer? And so uh, there are really two categories, two kind of umbrellas that we're going to we're, we're going to we're going to talk about. So the first umbrella is what I would call an irresistible proposition and an irresistible proposition. This is what most most marketers think of when they think about an, an offer. This is, of course, what are the deliverables, right? So you could say the features, advantages, benefits, what are, what are the, what's the stuff that people get, right? Like, you know, if it's an information product or something like that, it's videos, it's audios, it's workbooks, it's cheat sheets, it's checklists, it's all that stuff. It's the stuff that they actually get. Then there is price and terms, Right. So terms are, you know, like you might be you, the price might be a thousand bucks, but is it a thousand bucks today? Is it a thousand bucks in a month? Is it four payments of 250? Is it one payment today of 100 and then, you know, uh, nine more payments of, of, of 100 every month hereafter? And so what are the terms? Right. And just as a side note, you can radically change an offer without changing anything else other than the terms, meaning you could go from what's called a hard offer, your traditional typical, it's a thousand bucks, you pay it today, you take the product home, you use it, you blah, 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 
to a soft offer, pay nothing today, take the product home, use it, and only pay in 30 days when you're blown away by what this thing will do for you. And so you can manipulate and change an offer and the response that you get just by changing the terms and nothing else. Uh, but so we've got, you know, we've got the deliverables, we've got the price, we've got the terms, you've got um, premiums and bonuses. Those are the freebies that uh, come with the main core deliverables. Then you've got risk reversal. And so that, you know, typically we're, we're talking about, you know, a guarantee and there are so many different types. There's unconditional, conditional, there's a combination, there's money back, there's double your money back, there's we'll keep working. There's so many different variations of that. And then of course, there is a reason to respond now. And that's when you build in and you engineer things like urgency and scarcity, legit, real things in there. Um, deadline, all, all that kind of jazz. And so those components and manipulating those components are how we are able to engineer an irresistible proposition. And that's where the majority of marketers and entrepreneurs go and where the majority of, of entrepreneurs and marketers think when they're trying to develop an irresistible, uh, an irresistible offer. But that's only one part of it. What most don't think about is the other category, if you will, or the other uh, kind of umbrella, if you will. Um, and that is what I call an attractive solution. An attractive solution is really it takes into account things like how easy is it for the prospect to use the product or service and get the result? And how fast does it work to bring them the, um, the, the result? And how big of a result will it bring them? Right. So th th and this is an important point, right, that you want what you want to do is you want to first and foremost engineer an attractive solution, engineer, engineer a solution. Right. And let me take a step back for one second and say this, that everybody doesn't matter what you're marketing and selling. Everybody is is offering a solution because what people buy, people buy products and services to solve problems. Those those problems could be pain points right? Like things that are painful, things that they're unhappy with, frustration, struggles, obstacles that they want to get rid of. Those problems could also be unfulfilled needs or desires. And so I want a gorgeous green lush lawn and I have no idea how to do it. That's an unfulfilled desire, if you will. Both of those we call uh, a problem. What people spend money on, what people invest in are solutions to their problems. People don't want products and services for the products and service or, or service itself. They want the products and services for what they believe those products and services will do for them, right? They invest in products and services because they believe that it will solve a problem, alleviate a pain point, or give them an unfulfilled um, desire. At the root of that is how attractive is the solution that we are offering to somebody. So while we may be talking about having a green lush lawn, well, how attractive is the, is the solution? Forget how irresistible the proposition is is to get the solution for a second. How attractive is the solution itself? Is it gonna require five hours of my time outdoors every day, seven days a week for the next six months, right? Is it going to require me to make a massive investment in tools and, and, and technology? Is it gonna force me to hire somebody? Is it gonna have me working with chemicals that I don't wanna, uh, wanna work with? Is it gonna take me three months before I see a single you know, grass blade sprout up? And so, how attractive is the solution? So in an ideal world, when putting together these irresistible offers, we wanna start by engineering an attractive solution, right? And, and the closer we can get to something that is easy to use and implement and reap the rewards, something that works quickly to, to produce the result, something that uh, like, you know, uh, uh, the transformation happens with, call it the little work on, 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 their, on their part, there is a, a uh, we, we convey confidence, like assurance in them experiencing the, the, um, the result. And then we take that attractive solution. And now with that attractive solution, now we wrap it 
in an irresistible proposition. And so when you've got a really attractive solution, something that produces the result that the prospect wants, something that overcomes the problem that they that they desperately want uh, dealt with, right? And we have, right, we, we engineer this attractive solution. It works quickly, it's easy, it's easy to implement, blah, blah, blah. It's gonna work, work fast. And then we offer it with an irresistible proposition, meaning price, terms, premiums, bonuses, risk reversal. That's how you put together an irresistible offer. I love it. And I want to talk specifically, Todd, there is a, um, a point in time where you were, I think, speaking in a conference and a person came up to you afterwards. I love for you to tell this story because there's stuff going on in a potential customer's mind that we have no idea. And, and I would love to, I don't know if you remember what the offer was or product or risk reversal, because I'll have you tell the story, but sometimes people have failed over and over and over again. And you're not just overcoming what's on the page, you're overcoming all of their past experiences um, of what they've dealt with. So yeah. talk about that moment of time, what happened? Yeah, and so it's great. And you're, you're spot on, man. You know, we are, you know, human beings are just, we're complex creatures and we're never marketing and, and, and selling in a vacuum, right? Meaning like, you know, what people think uh, oftentimes new marketers, new entrepreneurs, they think that they're marketing and selling to people as if they were a blank canvas. Like they're starting from scratch with these people and not realizing you're not starting with a blank canvas. These people have prior beliefs and experiences. They have a perspective. Many, some people may be jaded uh, because of prior experiences and purchases. And, and there are deep fears and risks that the prospect perceives they have, not just financial, but, uh, you know, is this going to, you know, am I going to be embarrassed? Am I going to be intimidated? Am I going to be overwhelmed? Am I going to be overworked? Right? Like, is this going to be bad for my reputation? There's so many, so many things that we've got to, you know, remember uh, that, that, and people are dealing with all kinds of options obstacles. And I was reminded of this. So years ago, and I'll never forget this years ago, I was speaking at a, um, a conference. I can't, this is many years ago. And so I don't remember the topic that I was talking on, but I got off stage and I went to the back of the room. They went on, uh, on break right when I was done. And so uh, a whole bunch of people came over to me to talk to me after. And there was like this, you know, circle of, of great people around me asking me follow-up questions and kind of sharing with me their story. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see a gentleman standing just like two feet back from the group. And he was just standing there and waiting. And at, at first I thought maybe he was waiting for somebody to go on break. And then I saw that he was still he was there minutes later as I was still talking to everybody and as I continued to go one by one trying to talk to you know everybody that was waiting to speak to me I, I, I continued to see this gentleman out of the corner of my eye and finally when I wrapped up with everybody he he stepped forward and he, and he stepped to me and he shared with me that uh, for a number of years he had been investing in products and programs and trying things to get his business off the ground. I really wish that I could remember this gentleman's name. I cannot, it pains me to this day that I can't, uh, uh, but this conversation really impacted me. Uh, and he said to me, you know, he said he had tried things and his wife was basically like, that's it. He was working a full-time job. And his wife said to him, like, that's it. Like you are done. This is this entrepreneurial thing is just is not for you. Like we spent an arm and a leg. You've been trying for years now. And he said to her, he had just come across. I think one we of could my... all relate to that conversation oh, with I, the I, wife, Todd. You know, like... Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, um, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I know I certainly can. Um, and he had come across one of my offers, which I do not remember at the time what it was. And he said, he said to his wife, he said, you know, he said, babe, just this one last program. I, I think this, this could be it, which who knows, he, he could have said that many times before. This is it. This is it. Uh, but he said to her just this one more, you know, one more. Um, and then if this doesn't work, that's it. Right. I'll, I'll, you know, basically I'll, I'll give up on my dream and I'll just, you know, I'll continue to work my gig. He said, and so he, and he bought the, the program. And he said to me, he said, Todd, that was, you know, several months ago, I think like eight months or whatever. He said, that was eight months ago. He said, and I want you to know that I just left my job and I went full time in my business. Um, and that was just incredible for me. 
you know, it w- it was incredible for me. Forget the fact, you know, it was, it was incredible for me because I, and I think this is valuable for everybody, regardless of what marketplace niche you're in, that, you know, we have the ability to impact people, to change lives, whether you're, you're working with people for weight loss or fitness or wealth or relationships or, or business or marketing or, or, or whatever, that we have the chance to impact people. And sometimes we don't even realize the, the depth at which we can change the course of somebody's life. This was an individual that now gets to stay, you know, he's now home. He gets to be with his kids. He gets to live his entrepreneurial dream. He's got the autonomy, the freedom that he wants. Um, Maybe took him longer than he would have liked. I I think it takes us all longer than we would like, Um, you know, but that's the, you know, I really truly believe that anybody can be successful if they're willing to be committed, stay focused continue to put one foot in front of another um, because if others have done it before you, uh, then there's no reason why you can't do it. You know, Todd, I want to hear your favorite products or programs that you've purchased. You know, one of the ways I love to learn from the top people like yourself is I like to buy your stuff. And what I like to do is pay attention to what someone's doing, right? So if I, you know, someone goes to e5bundle.com, read the copy, right? Read the copy, see what testimonials are there, see what risk reversals there, buy the product, see what the follow-up is. So I would encourage anyone. I mean, same thing. I know you're, you're friendly with, with Russell Brunson and his stuff. I love buying the stuff to seeing what the upsell is and buying the upsell to see what happens from there. And so um, there's no better, uh, in my mind, lesson um, to experience someone and their learnings to actually buy the stuff, you know? Um, and I think, you know, for, so I just want to point out, I would love to hear your favorite programs um, and products you buy, but you know, you can go to e5bundle.com, check it out. I think it's just, you get it. Do you just pay for shipping? You get a free book. Yeah. You get to experience Todd's copy, what his, you know, he's poured probably his blood, sweat and tears into that. Uh, not just the book, but, but everything around it. So what have been some of your uh, breakthrough mentors or products for you? Yeah. So um, I'm also a student just like you. I, I love learning. I mean, I was I was a terrible student in, in high school. I was a terrible student growing up until I got bit by the marketing bug. Um, and then I then I just became a lifelong student. And so very similar to you, I, I love buying. I'm the worst because I, I can go into a a sales letter or a VSL and be like, oh, let me see what this person's doing. And by the end, um, at the end of the, the sales letter, I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to invest in silver. <laughs> I need to subscribe to this thing. And so I'm the worst, right? So, I, cause I buy everything. And so you want me on your list for sure. Um, and I too am, am you know, I, I recognize there's, there is so much to be learned everywhere. Like I, I really believe that, you know, I, I learn, oftentimes just as much from my clients as they do from me, you know, from our students as as much as they do from me. Um, I would say that specifically, so for me, um, as you can, you know, you can see. If anyone's uh, watching the video, you can see the the background. That is a real background. That's a With real background. Yeah. 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 Um, every now and then I like to pose on the ladder and I tell people, people ask me, they're like, you have a ladder in your, on your, in your library. And that ladder is more about my lack of height than it is the <laughs> height of the, 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 the library. Truth be told. So many of you probably wouldn't need a ladder to access the top shelf. I do. Um, but I like to, um, to read uh, typically like when I, when I start reading a book and, and I'll tell you my favorites in just a second, but when I, yeah. when I start reading a book and I find like, all right, I, I think this is going to be solid. I always, when it's possible, I always download the audio version and then go through them at the same time. So as I'm reading, I'll go through the audio. So I'm, I'm reading and listening to the audio at the, um, at the same time. That's the, that's for me personally, that's the best way for me to, um, to learn. I, I mean, look, I, I think um, while, you know, I, I think copy has changed the, 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 the art of, of effective copy has changed and evolved uh, over the years. I'm still a big fan favorite uh, still, excuse me, my, I'm a, I'm a fa- um, my, some of my favorites are the old school direct response book. So I believe the only book that I have two copies of, which is from our, our buddy, 
uh, Brian Kurtz is Breakthrough Advertising by Gene Schwartz. I actually have, and prior to Brian Kurtz, who, who now is the publisher of Breakthrough Advertising by Gene Schwartz, which is the greatest marketing book ever published, hands down, bar none. Before Brian was publishing it again, it, you know, it, there was like copies were like being sold for like $700. So when I got, I got a second copy of it as like my backup, God forbid something were to happen. Like I, I operated with this mentality of God forbid something happened to my house. God forbid the house caught fire in the, I'm grabbing my breakthrough advertising copy and then pictures of my wife and kids and, and in that order. The bold statement. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I'm just kidding, babe. If you watch yeah. this and you listen to that, uh, I'm sending it directly to her. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I, but uh, so breakthrough advertising is, is my all time favorite. I believe that it's a book that you, that a serious direct response marketer should read once a year. Uh, and every time you read it, you will, you will gain something new from it. Um, uh, how to write a, uh, is it how to write a great, how to write a good advertisement from Victor Schwab. Uh, I don't even remember that. I've read that so many times. Um, that is another tremendous, um, tremendous book. Um, Tested Advertising Methods by John Caples, the fourth version. So there's, I think there's version, there's five versions. You want the fourth version. Um, those three are like, if you, if you read those books once a year, just those three books every year, you get a rock solid foundation of critical uh, direct response principles. As it relates to, uh, to mentors, um, so I've had a number, uh, all of which turned into um, great friends of mine. So I would say that one of my first mentors is one of my best buddies online today, Rich Sheffrin, who you know, uh, one of the smartest dudes I know like a true, like, you know, like a brilliant guy, him and Jay Abraham are two just brilliant. Like I understand why they're such good friends. Uh, so rich, uh, Mark Ford, who, um, was really the marketing mastermind behind the Agora companies. Uh, uh, he, many, many folks might know him under his pen name, Michael Masterson. Uh, his book, Ready, Fire, Aim, is one of the greatest also business books um, ever published. I believe Mark is getting ready to release a new version of that book, which everybody should get. Um, and then the, um, the late, great Clayton Makepeace, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, was a tremendous influence on me. And so those guys were and, and like I said, I've learned from many. I've learned from the best of the best. I've, I learned stuff from, you know, the same, the same folks that you, you and, and listeners, viewers learn from. I've learned from almost everybody. Yeah, I, Carlene Inglake Cole on, uh, I think we talked for two hours, who was kind of a disciple of Clayton Makepeace. And she's His like number a, she, one. She's a His force number to be one, reckoned with. A beast, a beast, you know, num number one, like student, protege. Uh, yeah. Uh, you do a good I mean, job, Ty. You know, when we talk about Gene Schwartz, you do a good job of talking a little bit about the levels of prospect awareness and how I, I mean, even reading the book, I think I prefer listening to you talk about um, summing it up. Can you just give a brief, um, just a great brief synopsis of that? Is yeah, it so important? Sure. Yeah. And so, um, and I always share every time I talk about the, you know, the, the, the prospect, what we call, I call it the prospect awareness pyramid. I put it into a pyramid and I'll explain why in just a second. I, again, I learned it from uh, Gene Schwartz and then it was really drilled into me by um, Mark Ford. Uh, and so the prospect awareness pyramid, I want you to imagine a, a, a pyramid and there are five levels to this pyramid. And I just want you to look at this, this pyramid, or if you will, this triangle split into five pieces. I want you to look at this pyramid as your market. So your market is made up of people that are in that pyramid, in that triangle. And folks are at each of the five of the five levels. The different levels are really um, based on what is the, the person aware of. So let me, let me break this down a little bit at the very bottom of the, of the triangle, the bottom of the pyramid, we've got the unaware segment. 
These are people that are unaware of a problem and therefore they're not actively looking for a solution. So likely they're, they're not aware of any problem. They're not aware of the, the different you know, options out there. Like they're not actively looking for anything. They're not actively searching for a solution. They're not considering your product or your service because they're just unaware. And then one level up uh, on that pyramid, you've got problem aware. These are people that are aware that they've got a problem. Let's call it low back pain, for example, but they're unaware of the different options that they have. They're unaware of like what they're going to, they're, they're just aware that they've got low back pain and it's bothering them. And then a one level above problem aware, um, you've got solution aware. This let's say is the prospect who they're aware that they've got low back pain. And now they're trying to decide between you know, do I want to go to a chiropractor? Do I want to go to a massage therapist? Well, do I, should I get physical therapy? Like there are so many different options. What are the options that I want to, that I want to go with? So they're, they're kind of making their way through the different solutions out there. And then yet again, one level up from that um, is product aware. These are the people that let's say they've narrowed it down to a, to chiropractic. They realize I want a chiropractor, you know, I want chiropractic care. Um, and now they're searching for, let's say the best chiropractor in West Palm beach, Florida. And so now they're trying to decide, right. They, they know the solution they want or the product quote unquote that they want. And now they're comparing the options to get that product. And then one level above, which is the, the fifth level is most aware. And those are the people that they're, they're really like, they're aware of what it is that you do, your product, your service. They're aware of the difference between yours and, and the others out there. Um, and so uh, those are the different, the, the different levels. I'll explain in just a second why it's important that you understand which one of those levels you are targeting. The reason why I put that into a pyramid is because it's important for marketers and entrepreneurs to understand that the lower on the pyramid you go, right? So when we go all the way down to the bottom and we go to the unaware segment, that is the biggest universe. It's the biggest opportunity, right? It's the biggest universe of people that you can tap into to grow your business. At the same time, it is also the hardest. It's the hardest to convert, right? Because obviously we're talking about people that are unaware of a problem and unaware of the need for any kind of solution, right? And as you go up the pyramid, obviously going up the triangle, the, the every level of awareness that you go up, the marketplace and opportunity for scale decreases. So, right, once we go from, we go problem aware, we go solution aware, once you get to solution aware and product aware, the market, the opportunity, the, the, the number of folks for you to tap into, um, it, 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 it shrinks exponentially, but it becomes easier to convert. So as you go up the, the pyramid in terms of who you're targeting, uh, the universe of people shrinks, but the ease of conversion um, increases, meaning it becomes easier. So there's this give, there's this give and take, right? So the marketplace may shrink, right? Obviously, if you go to the top, the most aware, we're really talking about your, your customers, your clients, your patients, your tribe, people that know you, right? That's the smallest universe. Easiest to convert, smallest universe, right? So smallest, easy, easy to produce the sales, but the smallest opportunity for, uh, for volume of sales. The lower you go on the pyramid, the harder it becomes, but the more opportunity you, you, you have. The last thing that I want to say about this is that, um, is that the thing to understand is this, that whatever level, right? So understand that if we were trying to convert an unaware segment, what we are, what we have to say to them is going to be different than what we're going to say to somebody who's, let's say, at the product uh, or solution aware stage, right? Or the, the, the product aware stage. So the person who's like, I got back pain, I want a chiropractor, right? Uh, now I'm just looking for the best chiropractor. We would be able to have an ad or a marketing campaign that says something like how to find the best chiropractor in West Palm Beach, Florida. And that would work for those people at that awareness level. That's not going to work for the people that are unaware because they, they don't have a need or desire to find a chiropractor. And so what we're going to say to these different people uh, is different based on what level of awareness they're at. And that's why it's important to understand what level you are talking to, who in your marketplace you're talking to based on their level of awareness. The last thing that I'm going to say is this, and this is important, this is valuable. Whatever level of awareness you create the campaign for, it will work for that level and up, but it will not work for below it. So if you create a campaign 
for the product aware. It's going to work for product aware people and um, and the most aware people, but it's not going to work for solution aware, problem aware or unaware. Right. And so but if you create a campaign, a campaign for the unaware segment, it's going to work for that segment and every segment above it. So it's this weird give and take like, hey, if we create a campaign for the unaware segment, it is the most difficult to convert. It's going to require the most amount of chops, um, but it gives us the most amount of scalability because it's going to work for that segment, which is huge, plus every segment above it. If we only target, let's say, most aware, which is our customer base, right, it's going to be infinitely easier to convert those people. But the volume of sales that we can generate is going to be infinitely smaller because it's only going to work for that segment. And that segment is already small. And so did that make sense? Totally. Yeah. And we were talking before we hit record about I was asking what's top of mind. We were talking about economics of customer acquisition, front end campaigns, and then the approach to front end. I think it kind of applies to that mindset of what is the approach to the front end? Um, talk about your thinking around that approach to the front end offer. Yeah. So let's take a step back for one second, make sure everybody understands. So front end and back end. front end is all the marketing that we do with prospects people that have not participated in, a, in at least one transaction. And the aim of the front end is maximum customer or client acquisition at a reasonable cost, which we're going to come back to. So the front end is all about producing that first transaction. It's the single most expensive and most difficult part of every direct response driven business. The back end is all the marketing that we do with existing clients or buyers. The back end is all about producing the second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on transactions. And the back end is, is all about delivering more value and growing lifetime value. In other words, the, the back end is the real business that we're in. The back end is where all the profit is made in a direct response driven business. The front end is just about maximum customer acquisition at a reasonable um, at a reasonable cost. So prior or earlier when I, I said top of mind for me, what I've been thinking about lately, talking a lot to my own team about and, and our clients and students uh, lately uh, is engineering front end campaigns and the economics of front end campaigns. Uh, what I meant was this, that, and I'm going to say this rapidly. Uh, and, and so what I mean is this, number one is it's important for everybody to recognize that when you're an entrepreneur, you're an investor and you are investing in the acquisition of assets. Those assets are your buyers, your clients, your customers, your patients, right? Those assets, just like any other asset, just like whether it's fine art, whether it's an equity, whether it's real estate, those assets have a value today. They have a few, right? What the, the, that, that value today is the money that they spend with you the day that they become a client, buyer, patient, et cetera. They have a future value, which is based on our back end, right? How, like their second transaction, third, fourth, fifth, when they buy bagels again from you and then again from you and again from you or whatever. Um, and then there is a cost to acquire that asset. Just like there's a cost to acquire fine art and there's a value to that fine art today. And then there's this speculation of that fine art being worth more. There's, there is a, um, a stock, right? There's a price per share. That's what it's going to cost us to get it, right? The, the value of that per, you know, stock per share is the value that uh, we now have in our account. And then we're basing, right, the future value on speculation, what we believe it's going to go up to. The beauty in direct response is that we don't have to speculate on future value. We make decisions based on average buyers. So over time, as, you, as a business becomes more mature and is around longer, we're able to determine what is the future value of a buyer. What's the one month value, two month, three month, five month, nine month, 12 month, and so on. So we know on average, just like Netflix knows on average, when somebody subscribes, how long they're going to stay. Some stay a lot longer, some stay a lot shorter, but they know that there is an, is an average. Well, so I'm sharing all that because the whole game really comes down to understanding that you're just an investor. And it comes down to understanding that he or she, and Dan Kennedy said this many moons ago, but I'm going to translate this into why this has been top of mind for me and something that I've been talking about lately. Dan Kennedy said, which is absolutely spot on, he said that the entrepreneur that can spend the most to acquire a new buyer wins. And that is absolutely right. It's the antithesis 
of the way the typical mom and pop entrepreneur operate. Typical mom and pop view marketing, advertising as an expense. It's a line item on a p and as, 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 as if it was an expense like the internet, the electric, whatever is. But the reality is, is that um, the, the game is not how can we spend less and less to acquire customers? The game is how can we spend more and more to acquire customers? How can we afford to spend double what it is that we're spending right now to acquire a single customer? Because the more money that you can invest to acquire a single customer, the easier the game becomes, right? The easier the game becomes and the more of an advantage you have. If let's say we could spend $300 to acquire a customer and one of our competitors could only spend 50 bucks to acquire that same customer, they're done. They're done. We're going to crush them because we can do things they can't do. We can use traffic sources they can't use. We can invest money to send things in the mail that they can't invest. We could have campaigns that are converting a third as well as their campaigns are, are converting, and it still works for us economically. And so, um, so the game is really thinking about and figuring out how can you afford to spend more and more to acquire a buyer? And what that comes down to is how do I make the buyer worth more to us, spend more the day that they become a buyer? And how do I increase their future value? How do I get them to spend more, more often in the future? Because as the value of a buyer goes up, the more money you have to invest to acquire a buyer. And so that's the first point that I, that I want to make. The second point is to recognize that that the whole game of front end, of front end acquisition of acquisition is an, a game of economics, meaning it's not a game of sales conversion rate. People talk about, right? Like, you know, I got an 8% sales conversion rate. The reality is this, depending on the economics of the campaign, depending on what, right, what you're, what it's costing you to get a visitor, depending on, you know, uh, the, the average order value or the average transaction value, right? Like the reality is you can have an 8% sales conversion rate. You could have a 10% sales conversion rate and be losing money every single sale. You could also have a half a percent sales conversion rate and be banking massive money every single sale. At the end of the day, sales conversion rate is just a performance metric. It just tells us how well a particular page or stage of the marketing campaign is performing. But what it doesn't tell you is whether a front end campaign is viable or not. Viable meaning I can continue to run it at scale to acquire more and more buyers. And so the game is not one of sales conversion rate. It, it, the, the, the game is one of a financial exchange. What I mean by that is this. There are two numbers that are the most important numbers in all of direct response marketing when it comes to customer acquisition and generating buyers at scale. Those two numbers are one, CPA, cost per acquisition. How much does it cost you to acquire a new buyer? So you spend a thousand bucks or invest a thousand bucks in Facebook ads, you get 10 new buyers. That thousand dollars divided by 10 buyers tells you we have a cost per acquisition of 100 bucks. It costs us $100 to acquire each of those 10 new buyers. That's CPA. That's the cost side. People will usually say to me like, Todd, is a, is a $100 CPA good? Well, I don't know. I can't tell you until we have the other side of the equation. A CPA of 100, a cost to acquire the asset of $100 may be good if let's say every new buyer spends 300 bucks with you, but it's not good if every buyer spends $3 with you, right? And so it all depends. We need both sides of the equation. On the other side of the equation, so CPA on the cost side, on the value side, we have AOV. AOV is average order value. That's the average amount of money that a buyer spends the day they become a buyer with you. So if you've got these campaigns, like you had mentioned, you know, you go through campaigns that have upsells, downsells, bumps, all that kind of stuff. Well, some people just buy the core offer. Some people buy the core offer and the bump. Some people buy the core offer, the bump and upsell number one. Some people buy everything. There, there is an average. In direct response, we deal with averages. And so we look at, well, we generated 10 buyers and let's say we generated a total of a thousand bucks, right? Some of those people spent maybe 150. Some of those people maybe spent 50, right? You know, we, we generated a total of a thousand bucks. And so in that instance, we generated a thousand bucks. We got 10 buyers, a thousand bucks divided by 10 buyers tells us we have an average order value of a hundred. We also said that we have a cost per acquisition of 100, right? So it costs us $100 to acquire a buyer. 
each buyer was worth on average $100. Now to the mom and pop, that's a terrible, that's a terrible transaction, right? Because it's, well, where, how do we make money? Because they don't realize, they don't understand the difference between front end and back end. To us, in the know, to your listeners, your viewers, that should be looked at, viewed as a grand slam home run because you just acquired the single most valuable asset in your business for free. You acquired buyers at no cost. Your bank account is no less today than it was five days ago. You have the same amount of money in your bank account, only now you have the most valuable asset in your business. You got 10 new buyers that you are that now gonna put into your back end. Now you'll notice I said, that should be viewed as a grand slam home run. You're acquiring buyers for free. You think about, you ask people out of this context, you say, if I could give you um, a thousand new buyers, people, buyers, not leads, not prospects, buyers on your list um, for free at no cost to you, would that be valuable? They'd say, of course it would. Sure, I'd love to have access to a thousand new buyers. That's what we're talking about here, right? We're just talking about a financial exchange. Thousand goes out, thousand comes back comes back along with, in this case, 10 new, 10 new buyers. And so what you'll notice is that I didn't say anything about sales conversion rate. I don't care what the sales conversion rate is in that, in that transaction. I don't care whether it's a half a percent, whether it's 8%, I don't really care what I do care about, right? Cause I can't deposit sales conversion rate. What I do care about is that I, I spent a hundred, I made back a hundred and I got a customer. I spent a hundred, I made back a hundred and I got a customer. I'll do that all day, every day, regardless of what the sales conversion rate is. And so that's what I meant when I said that now, when it comes to the, the you got to look, you're an investor, you're investing in the acquisition of assets. Those assets have a value and a future value. Those assets have a cost. The name of the game is engineering your campaigns so that the economics work so that the CPA and AOV work, regardless of what the sales conversion rate is. At the end of the day, sometimes you may have to be willing to lower the sales conversion rate to make the economics work. Meaning you might have to, you, you might be running a $10 offer with some upsells and bumps and whatnot. And because of the cost of traffic, which is, which you have very little control over, right? The marketplace determines the cost of traffic, right? You economically, can't make it work. Meaning, right? Like you're, if you're spending $4 to get a visitor to your website, and you're selling a $10 product. It's going to be very difficult to get to break even on that, on that kind of campaign. You might say, but I'm, I'm converting at 10%. You're still, you're, if you're not able to recoup your ad spend, right, then it may, you, you might not want to go negative to acquire, to acquire buyers. You might have to, we might have to say, Hey, you know what? Let's go from 10 bucks to 39 bucks, knowing that our sales conversion rate is going to go from 10%, maybe down to 7%. And now let's look at the numbers because at the end of the day, right? I don't care if the sales conversion rate is sky high. If those numbers, CPA and AOV don't work, you do not have a viable campaign. But yet if those numbers do work, regardless of what your sales conversion rate is, regardless of how low it is, you do have a viable campaign. Make sense? Totally. And um, I, I love, you know, at the Brian's event, I don't, it must have been five or six years ago, the Titans event. And I remember listening to Greg Ranker talk about proactive and how it was, it was astounding to me. They knew, okay, at month they would go deep, whatever it was, nine months, they spent yeah. nine months. They knew month 10, they would, you know, obviously be profitable because they knew the lifetime value, but they'd spend nine months of that customer in the negative, just because they knew those numbers and they knew the lifetime value of those customers. And it was very, very amazing. common, very, very common. I'll tell you that most of the biggest, fastest growing direct response um, companies and marketers and marketers go negative on the front, right? Like in other words, so we go negative on the front on the majority of our campaigns because it allows us to acquire more buyers. In other words, right? Like, um, you know, the, the reality is, is that, you know, is that it just allows you to be more aggressive. And so when you recognize that you're acquiring assets and those assets have a future value and you know what that future value is because you've got your tracking and metrics and dashboards in place um, and you understand the numbers, the arithmetic of direct response, uh, direct response and investing, well, then it's just like any other investment, right? Like, look, if you acquire a buyer and that buyer is worth a hundred bucks today, but the average buyer goes on to spend another thousand dollars with you, another hundred bucks a month, every month for the next 10 months. Well, now what are you willing to invest to get that $100 buyer? 
Maybe you're willing to invest a hundred, right? Maybe you're willing to invest 120 to get that hundred dollar buyer, even though you're going negative $20, but you know, in 30 days from now, you're going to recoup that 20 plus another 80, right? And so knowing that, and, and again, this is important for everybody to understand, knowing that, look, if I go, if I say, Hey, you know what? I could spend a hundred bucks to get a, a new, a new buyer. Cause they spend a hundred bucks with me. And so on day one, and so I break even, and then they go on to spend a hundred bucks a month, every month for the next, next 10 months. But you know what? If I go to 120, now I have an additional $20 that I can invest and use to get, to get buyers. Now my marketing could perform even worse in terms of conversion rate, right? Like if I was willing to go from a hundred to $200, because I know my metrics and I've got the cash flow to float. Now, legitimately, I could run the same campaign at half the conversion rate that it's at right now, and it'll still work for me. And so the point is that you not only, the, the more that you're willing to invest to get a buyer, not only does it, do you put yourself in, in, in a position where you can do things that your competitors can't do, uh, you could also use less effective marketing and it still works because at the end of the day, we're not, we're not playing a game of conversion rate. We're playing a game of financial exchange, right? And so when people say like, you know, like, I, you know, I want an 8% sales conversion rate, that, that's cool. I, me, I just want like, I just want for every dollar that I put out there, I just want a certain amount of money back. It might be, I just want 80 cents back. And I don't care whether it's a half a percent sales conversion, 2%, right? Like when you have a business and your business, let's just say whatever, for argument's sake, does 10 million a year. Let's just say it does, you know, you, you acquire, you know, 30,000 new buyers every year. Let's just say no one asks you what was your sales conversion rate on those 30,000 buyers, unless they're a novice new marketer. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. What matters is what did it cost you to acquire those buyers and what were those buyers worth to you? Right. That's what matters. Totally. Todd, first of all, thank you. Um, I want to point people, uh, last thing I want to point people to e5bundle.com. And um, if you have a minute or two, just to explain a little bit about E5 method and what people can, can find uh, in the book and with the methodology. Yeah, awesome. And so I'll make this quick. Uh, um, and so the E5 method is really a process that, uh, that allows a reliable, consistent process for engineering effective front end campaigns that you can use to acquire buyers, clients, patients at scale from paid traffic. So it is a way to create the right idea, angle, hook, messaging, argument, um, and offer to be able to uh, roll out a campaign to cold traffic uh, using paid ads to scale your business, your new, your, your new customers. And so that's, what's covered in the, um, in the book, the book, I think is about 300 pages, 330, something like that. And then on that page, there's a whole bunch of bonus trainings that folks will get immediate access to if they're interested while they're waiting for the, the book to get shipped. And so, um, yeah, and I probably did it. I did it a, a, a gross disservice <laughs> in that explanation of the E5 method, but I'll let people enjoy What's, the book. Um, and see for themselves. What is a fan favorite of what either in the bundle or in the book when people uh, tell you, talk to you about it after the fact? Uh, I mean, uh, um, everybody raves about the, um, the bonuses, but I think the book is, it's not your typical, like, while well, look, I, I believe there is at least one call to action in the book to go learn more about our E5 coaching program. The book is stacked. And so it, it will, I think, give it was it's really it'll give ahas to how do you find the right hook and angle for your marketing campaign? How do you tap into the right emotion that drives your prospects to buy? How do you differentiate your, your product or service uh, and identify a unique mechanism so it stands out as something not only different, but superior? How do you, you know, what's the one belief that you need your prospects to have before you introduce your offer? How do you construct the offer and then present the like it's just the book is what people um really love the most but like i said while you're waiting for the book you'll get immediate access to the uh to the goodies and then todd what are other ways people can engage with you like services or product wise because i know you have the coaching program i believe you have a mastermind i've you know 
Um, I think Greg Roulette has raved about you. David Long has raved about you. I've had on the podcast. How else great guys. Engage? Those guys are easy yeah. to please because they're super smart, super great guys. Both of those guys. Um, but so we do have a mastermind, but that mastermind is really for a certain caliber of, um, of client. And so it's not really for the masses. It's by application only. It's called a top one mastermind. Um, but I, I recommend that folks start with the E5 coaching program. And it's basically, it is basically where we will, we hold your hand for 10 weeks, week by week, helping you to create your own, create and launch your own E5 campaign, which is a campaign that you'll be able to use evergreen perpetually, like I said, with paid traffic to acquire um, new buyers. Folks can learn more about that, I believe, if they really want to just leap over the E5 bundle at, I think it's learnfromtodd.com. Learnfromtodd.com. You, you'll speak to somebody on the team. They'll see if it's the right fit for you. They'll explain how the program works, uh, if that's what you're interested in. Yeah. Or just go to e5bundle.com, buy it, and you'll probably find out about it down the road. There you but go. Todd, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I mean, I was taking copious notes, three pages here. So you were check. supposed to keep me on track. You I were supposed we, to I not thought we were me. on track. I hope I, I hope I was, and I hope I didn't, you know, at one on point I was like, time. oh my gosh. Okay. This is, all right. This has been fantastic. Sure. Are you kidding? Just want to make sure. Okay. Thank you, uh, everyone. Check out more episodes. Check out e5bundle.com. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.